Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at a different kind of definite integral. The kind of integral where the area is a little harder to interpret. We could be taking a look at a couple different kinds of regions bounded by curves that either have an asymptote, maybe horizontally, or an asymptote vertically, where the area may appear to be infinite, but might not actually be infinite. So let's take a look at an example and see what I mean by that. Here I've got a function, 1 over x squared, and I'm going to look at the area below that, bounded by 1 over x squared in the x-axis, over the region from 1 to infinity. Now this function has a horizontal asymptote. So if I am looking at the area to the right of x equals 1, I know that this function is going to continue to approach 0. And well, the, the amount of area that I start accumulating is going to be decreasing. Now, is it possible that this area here is maybe finite? Now, because I haven't really drawn this to scale and because it's a little bit harder to visualize, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Desmos here and you'll be able to see a little of animation. Well, here is that graph drawn to scale. You can see there's, there's the asymptote there to the left over by the x-axis. and The function just flies off the handle vertically. And here is x equals 1, and I can drag the area over. So I'm going to start at 1 and slowly start to add area until I get to x equals roughly 2. And you can see that's this little slider. b is 1.998 now, approximately 2. And I've got the definite integral being roughly a half, which we should be able to calculate. That's just, that's just a typical definite integral. But now, what if I let b increase? You can see area is increasing, 0.747 still increasing 0.83 but it's starting to increase slower and slower that 0 0.86 0 0.87 eventually i get to 0 0.88 and it starts to really slow down now on this slider bar here i can let b go way up to 100 which would be off this graph completely but if you take a look going farther and farther this is just getting really really skinny almost no area so I'm going to drag this bar further and further. By the time I get to b equals 16, I've only gotten as far as 0 0.9375. Continuing to scroll over, I am really not seeming to increase much anymore. And it looks like it's approaching roughly 1. The area here shaded in green, we say, is getting closer to 1. We say it's actually it's converging. That area doesn't appear to be infinite because it's only ever going to get as close to 1 as we want it to be. So we say that that area, or the definite integral, is actually equal to 1. That this is convergent. So with that concept in mind, we think about this kind of shape here. We're looking for integrals where we are having an interval that is from 1 to infinity of a function that hopefully allows this area to converge to an actual value. So in this little section, improper integrals, we're going to be figuring out how to handle these kind of integrals first, where we have an infinite region. We call that a type 1 improper integral. Now, as you can probably imagine, these kind of integrals will involve limits of some kind. Anytime that we are looking for a region from A to infinity, well, we can't just evaluate that without, first of all, replacing infinity with a variable t. Just like my slider bar there in Desmos, t is going to be something that I'm then going to let go to infinity, and this will allow me to evaluate the definite integral and then evaluate the limit. If the limit does exist, then we say that this integral is convergent. If the limit doesn't exist, if this is infinite, then we say it's divergent. And in case b, it's quite possible that our interval actually goes from b backwards to negative infinity. So from negative infinity to b, we'll replace negative infinity with t. That's kind of like that slider bar. And we're going to slide it backwards to negative infinity by looking at the limit as t goes to negative infinity. And it is quite possible to find functions out there where the area under a function over all real numbers could potentially be convergent. That will only happen if we have some value a that we split this integral up into from negative infinity to a and a to infinity. And if both of those are convergent, only then can we say that the area over all real numbers is convergent. 
If either of these or both of these integrals are divergent, then unfortunately that results in our integral on the left-hand side being divergent. So let's go ahead and try a couple examples and see when we might have convergent, when we might have divergent type one in proper integrals. Now in Desmos, we just found that this first integral the definite integral of one over x squared from one to infinity seemed to be convergent to one. But our slider bar could only go up to 100 and we only got an area of 0.99. So we're gonna do a little better than that by now using limits as t goes to infinity. We're gonna change this definite integral so that its boundaries are one and t. And then we're gonna take that and start sliding that t all the way over to infinity by taking the limit as t goes to infinity. But otherwise, our integrand doesn't change. 1 over x squared dx. And here we're using really t because we have x equals 1 and x equals t. t is some value that we're assigning x at the right-hand side of our interval. We shouldn't be using x here since that is the variable that we're integrating with respect to. Now luckily, this is a fairly easy definite integral. We just have to attach a limit problem to that. The antiderivative of 1 over x squared would be negative 1 over x. And we're going to evaluate that from 1 to t. Plugging in t and 1, we have negative 1 over t minus negative 1, or 1 minus 1 over t. Now, of course, 1 over t fits in a nice category of rational functions where we have 1 over t to some power. As long as the power down here is positive, 1 over t to any positive power will go to 0 as t goes to infinity. So this is simply equal to 1. But compare that with another example that is very similar. If I were to reduce the power of x in the denominator and just have 1 over x, then we may end up with a little bit of a different result. In this case, we say the limit as t goes to infinity of the definite integral from 1 to t of 1 over x dx. And the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural logarithm of x. And the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of x. So we'll evaluate that at t and 1. Now the natural logarithm of 1 is simply just equal to 0. And since t is larger than 1, the natural logarithm of the absolute value of t can simply be written out as the logarithm of t since the absolute value of t is simply equal to t when t is positive. Now the natural logarithm of t is a function that doesn't have a horizontal asymptote. So as t goes to infinity, the natural logarithm of t continues to increase without bound when we say it gets infinitely large. In this case, the limit on this particular function, it doesn't exist. We still say equals infinity, but that's just us describing the behavior, the natural logarithm function just continues to increase without bound. The limit doesn't actually equal a number, so the limit doesn't exist, which means that this case, we end up with a divergent integral. So it doesn't take very much of a difference. One over x squared was convergent, and it converges to one, but when we have only one over x, it is divergent. Now, as I said earlier, there are actually functions where the definite integral from negative infinity positive infinity can still be convergent. So let me show you an example here in Desmos. What I have here is a family of functions, f of x equals one over s root two pi times e to the negative 0 0.5 times x minus m over s all squared. Now it's a pretty complicated looking function, but you may recognize this in statistics. This is a very common shape. This is a normal distribution although a lot of us may just refer to this as a bell curve. Now, m and s are just two parameters. By adjusting m, I can shift the center point of this bell curve, and s will adjust the shape of it. And I can make this flatter, or I can make it taller. But what's impressive here is no matter what m and s are, let's suppose I want to look at the definite integral from a to b of f of x, but I want to let a go to negative infinity and b go to positive infinity. So remember, calculating this by hand, I would have to split this up into two separate integrals. For one of the integrals, I'll be taking my first endpoint and taking the limit as t goes to negative infinity. And for my second interval, I'll be letting the 
end point on the right go to positive infinity. And if I do that, take a look at this integral. It's slowly approaching one. In fact, Desmos here will eventually just spit out one because it can't really show me enough decimal places. So the area under this whole curve over all real numbers is convergent to one. And it doesn't really matter whether I make the curve flatter. You see, I'll have less area in the middle, but a little bit more area as I go further out away from the y-axis. Still, however, you can see that that's approximately equal to one. Or I can make this a little bit taller, still equals one. I can shift this. I can do all kinds of transformations and it, the area under the curve here is always still just equal to one. However, trying to integrate this one by hand is gonna be an impossible task. With any kind of integral of e to x squared, we're gonna have a real tough time trying to find any kind of method that works here. So I won't recommend trying this one by hand. This is definitely more for using a computer algebra system or something like Desmos Online here as an example. All right, now there is another kind of improper integral that we're gonna be taking a look at. Type one is where we have an infinite interval for integration. And type two is where we're integrating over an interval where the function has a discontinuity, such as an asymptote. In the case of a type two improper integral, let's say that f of x has a discontinuity at one of the endpoints. Well, let's start off where f is continuous at a, but not at b. It has some kind of discontinuity. It has some kind of discontinuity at the right-hand endpoint of our interval. Well, then we're going to be using a limit strategy again, since we can't actually use the fundamental theorem of calculus and plug b into this function, since it is not continuous. We're just going to take the definite integral from a to t, where t will be some value between a and b and we'll let t approach b from the left-hand side. If the limit exists, then this integral is convergent. If it does not exist, and this limit may end up being infinite, then we'll say it's divergent. Now, another possibility is that our function has a discontinuity at the left endpoint. So when we have a definite integral from a to b of our function f of x, we can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus and plug in a because of that discontinuity. So we'll have to actually change this to be an interval from t to b, where t is a value between a and b, and we'll let t approach a from the right-hand side. Again, that could be convergent or divergent. Now, be careful. It's sometimes hard to spot these, but we may have a definite integral from a to b of a function that is continuous at a and continuous at b, but it has a discontinuity somewhere in the middle of the interval. If that's the case, we can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus because that requires our function to be continuous over the whole interval. We're going to actually have to go and split this up into separate components, A to C and C to B, and we'll have one interval being discontinuous on the right, and we'll have one interval being uh, having a discontinuity on the left-hand side. Both of those have to converge in order for the integral on the left-hand side to converge. So let's try a couple examples of type two improper integrals now. Okay, here's an example of an integral that looks pretty innocent on the surface. Pretty easy to find the antiderivative of three over x minus four and just apply the fundamental theorem of calculus by plugging in five and two. But unfortunately, this function has an asymptote when x equals four. So what are we going to do? Well, the only way to try to see whether or not this might be convergent is to split this up into two separate problems. We're going to be looking at an interval from 2 to 4 and a second interval from 4 to 5. And we can tackle each of these as being a separate problem and see whether or not each of these integrals are convergent. If they are both convergent, then we can actually come up with an answer to this. But if either one of them or both happen to be divergent, then unfortunately we won't be able to say that this integral is convergent anymore. It would simply be divergent. Let's try this first one. Simply by taking the limit now as t approaches four, and since we're choosing t to be a value between two and four, we're gonna be approaching from the left-hand side of four. Okay, now that three is a constant multiple, so I can pull that out front, and I'm left with one over x minus four, 
And the antiderivative of 1 over x minus 4 is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of x minus 4. Now, I need to evaluate that from 2 to t, and I need to take the limit as t approaches 4 from the left-hand side. We can start by plugging in 2 and t here. And that 3, being a constant, can be moved out front of the limit. Okay, now be careful with these absolute values here. The absolute value of negative 2 would simply be 2. On the absolute value of t minus 4, if t is slightly less than 4, well, we know that's going to be a negative number, so that's going to be equal to negating that expression, t minus 4, which gives us negative t plus 4, or 4 minus t. Now that we've got rid of those absolute value signs, it might be a little bit easier to understand. The natural logarithm of 4 minus t, what is going to happen as t approaches 4? Well, this is going to get closer and closer to the natural logarithm of 0. It's going to be very, very close. 4 minus 3.999 is almost 0. And remember that our natural logarithm function has a vertical asymptote might even help maybe just draw a quick picture. Here is the graph of the natural logarithm of x. We know as x is approaching 0, then we find out that the natural logarithm approaches negative infinity. In that case, you can see the same behavior here. The natural logarithm of an expression tending to 0, that's going to mean this goes to negative infinity. And because that natural logarithm of 4 minus t goes to negative infinity, you can see that this limit here does not exist. Since this is getting infinitely large and negative, subtracting the natural logarithm of 2, and then multiplying by 3, unfortunately none of that is going to make this limit equal some real number. This limit does not exist, and that first integral is divergent. If that first integral is divergent, we don't even have to worry about checking the second one. We would say that definite integral of 3 over x minus 4 from 2 to 5 is divergent overall. Okay, like I say, it's deceptive here. It just looks like a nice fundamental theorem of calculus. You just have to remember that this denominator here is what is causing us the problem. x cannot equal 4. All right, let's try a more typical kind of type 2 integral, maybe that is convergent. Well, let's take a look at uh, function 1 over the square root of x and make the interval start at 0. So you can see there's already a problem. 0 is not in the domain of 1 over root x. Well, if we take the interval from 0 to 9, 9 is not a problem. There's simply just a discontinuity at one endpoint. So to evaluate this, if the limit exists, we'll say it's convergent. We need to take the limit as t approaches 0 from the right-hand side now. Evaluate that using the fundamental theorem of calculus at 9 and t, and then take that limit and see whether or not this could end up being convergent. All right, well, the antiderivative of 1 over root x. Remember that this can be rewritten as a power x to the negative 1 half. Raising the power by 1 gives us x to the power 1 half. Dividing by 1 half is the same as multiplying by 2. So the antiderivative would be 2 times x to the 1 half, or 2 root x, perhaps, instead. Now, we'll evaluate that from t up to 9, and the 2 can be pulled out front of the limit. That gives us the square root of 9 minus the square root of t. Now, what happens as t goes to 0? Well, the square root of 9 is simply just 3, and as t goes to 0, the square root of t approaches 0. So evaluating the limit gives us 2 times 3 minus 0, which is equal to 6. And so this is actually a convergent interval. All right, well, let's take a look and see if we can visualize that with Desmos again. Here is that function 1 over root x. If I zoom out, you can really see it's got that vertical asymptote that's very abrupt, and you can see the area under the curve here would be getting very marginal as we start getting closer up to the, this y-axis here. Now, I've got a little slider at a, which is roughly around 8 right now. And I'm going to just slowly drag that back and see what happens to the area. It's going to be increasing for sure, but let's see what happens. You're going to get a lot of increase of area all of a sudden, but then it gets to be pretty slow to increase after that. And I can continue to get this smaller and smaller and smaller 
closer to the y-axis, and I've got this at a equals 0 0.001 now. So I really, I'm trying to take the limit as a goes to zero in this example. You can see the area is now at 5.936. And zooming out, that green region is going way up to the stars here, but there's almost no area up here. Most of the area was already covered in this first little while when I let a go from 9 closer to 1 or 0.5. Really beyond that, I'm not getting a lot more area anymore. So that's the idea of an improper integral. Now, there are some very important integrals that we can kind of compare these two and get a sense of when an integral is convergent or divergent using a comparison. All right. Now, unsurprisingly, this is called the comparison theorem. Now, let's suppose that f of x and g of x are two functions that are always greater than or equal to zero for an interval from a to infinity. g, however, is always smaller than f. Keep that in mind. g is smaller than f, and of course that means that f is bigger than g, although they could be equal to each other at certain points in the interval. Well, let's suppose that the integral of f of x from a to infinity is convergent. Well, since g of x is always going to be less than or equal to f, but always positive, then the integral of g of x from a to infinity must also be convergent. Similarly, we can conclude one other thing, that whenever the integral of g of x from a to infinity is divergent, since f is larger, then the integral of f of x from a to infinity is also divergent. There are a couple of things that we can't actually conclude with the comparison theorem. If the definite integral of g of x from a to infinity converges, then we don't really know anything about the integral of f of x from a to infinity. That's something that's smaller that's convergent doesn't tell us that a bigger thing is convergent or divergent. Similarly, this won't allow us to conclude that if the integral of f of x from a to infinity diverges, that the integral of g of x from a to infinity converges or diverges. Essentially, if a bigger thing is divergent, we don't really know if a smaller thing is convergent or divergent. So there's two things that it doesn't allow us to actually conclude. It only allows us to conclude these two exact if-then statements. Let's see how we can maybe use that to shortcut whether or not an uh, integral is convergent or divergent without even having to use limits or calculate the value. In our first example, we saw that the integral of 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity converges to 1. So if that is convergent, then we can use that and compare similar kind of rational expressions. We could then really just change it slightly and have a new integral where our function is 1 over x squared plus 2. Well, if I increase the denominator by 2, then that's certainly going to be less than 1 over x squared. And because I have a function that is less than 1 over x squared, and I'm using the same interval, I know that this must be convergent. We could say that that integral is convergent or that it converges, although we actually don't know what it converges to or what the value is. We'd have to go ahead and repeat the whole process of using limits to do that. I could make this a little more complicated and come up with another integral that's also actually very similar to 1 over x squared, even if it doesn't appear to be similar at all at first glance. Well, here I've got something that doesn't look like 1 over x squared at all. But the numerator, x minus 1, I'm taking 1 away from x in the numerator, so that fraction would be slightly less than a fraction that simply had x in the numerator. Okay, well, in the denominator, you can see I have plus 3x. If I wasn't adding 3x in the denominator, then, well, it would be a little bit bigger fraction. So x over x cubed would be a little bit bigger than x over x cubed plus 3x, since my denominator there was actually a little bit smaller. And x over x cubed is equal to 1 over x squared. And that is convergent. So 1 over x squared is equal to x over x cubed. So that is bigger than x over x cubed plus 3x, and that is bigger than x minus 1 over x cubed plus 3x. As I'm going from the right-hand side of this chain of inequalities and equations, I'm really either staying equal or getting smaller. 
So this is kind of like my g of x, and g of x is definitely less than or equal to my f of x over here. Since I know that the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx is convergent, I then also know that the integral from 1 to infinity of g of x dx must be convergent as well. All right, well, this comparison theorem is only as good as the number of convergent or divergent integrals that you've already discovered. If you want to use the comparison theorem really well, you kind of need to have a whole repertoire of improper integrals that you know are convergent or divergent. And this is one of those kind of examples right here. 1 over x squared is convergent. We also saw that if we have 1 over x, it was divergent. These are functions of the form 1 over x to the power p. If we have a function of that form, 1 over x to the p, and we want to look at the definite integral of 1 over x to the p from a to infinity, where a is bigger than 0, this is going to be convergent if p is greater than 1, and it'll be divergent if p is less than or equal to 1. So our example of 1 over x squared and where a is equal to 1, we saw that that was convergent. But we saw that our function 1 over x, taking the integral from 1 to infinity, that was divergent. These are p integrals, and it's going to be very helpful to use the comparison theorem to functions of that kind of form, 1 over x to the p. Let's take a look at the integral of x plus 5 over the cube root of x squared minus a from 4 to infinity. And what we're going to do is try to compare that to one of these p integrals. Now, it's a little bit tricky to set up some of these inequalities. What we do is we start off with our expression in the integrand, and then we're going to remove one of the terms from the numerator or denominator, and then start to see whether or not removing a term is going to increase or decrease the value. So let's start off in the numerator, and let's remove this minus 5 and just write out a new fraction simply with x in the numerator over the cube root of x squared minus 8. Now, x minus 5 in the numerator is going to give a smaller fraction than x. Now, setting up the inequalities is a little bit tricky. We're going to start off with the expression that is in the integrand, x plus 5 over the cube root of x squared minus 8, and we're going to remove a term from the numerator or denominator and compare the two fractions. So let's remove the term of plus 5 from the numerator and simply write a new expression with only x in the numerator. The plus 5 is a fairly insignificant term when we know x is going to infinity, so it's probably a good one to remove first. Now, looking at this x in the numerator versus x plus 5 in the denominator, since x is positive, x plus 5 is definitely going to be a larger positive number than x is going to be, so our initial expression is greater than our new rational expression. And we'll continue this chain and hope that all of our inequalities go the same direction. Let's remove this minus 8 from the bottom. Now we'll have x over the cube root of x squared. This will leave us with a slightly larger denominator, since we're no longer subtracting 8 in the denominator. Larger denominators, like 1 quarter, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, are always a little bit smaller. So this is good. Our inequalities are all pointing in the same direction. And from here, we can actually just re-express that by using some powers of x. x over 2 thirds is equivalent to x to the power 1 third. And if we want to write that as a p function, 1 over x to the p, then this is going to be 1 over x to the negative 1 third. See, right off the bat there, since p is less than or equal to 1, this is a divergent integral. If that is divergent, and through the series of inequalities, our integrand is larger than that p function, it must also be divergent as well. And there we go. That's using the comparison theorem to right away rule that out from being convergent. But the inequalities are always tricky to set up. Make sure that we want really all of these inequalities to point the same direction. Saying that one quantity is larger than another, but that that quantity is smaller than the next one, isn't really going to be able to allow us to compare non-adjacent quantities anymore. If all of the inequalities are pointing in the same direction, it's really easy to compare our initial expression with this final p-value expression. So there's the comparison theorem. It's just one of many ways that you can kind of rule out 
an integral from being convergent, or maybe say it is convergent, but you have to be able to compare the correct kind of functions and have the right kind of inequalities. Otherwise, you should hopefully be able to evaluate when an integral is convergent using limits. Just essentially replace the problem, whether that's infinity in your interval, or a value where the function is discontinuous with t, and then just take the limit as t approaches whatever value you're supposed to be looking for. Then hopefully, if it's convergent, you'll get some sort of value from that limit, and if the limit doesn't exist, then we say it's divergent. But totally different than our normal kind of definite integrals where it's just the area. It should be finite. Area makes more sense. This time around, you kind of have to imagine having areas get very, very small, but somehow adding up infinite amount still yeah, gives you a finite area. It's a little bit weird to kind of visualize. Well, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.